James chapter 5, and, and, and that's where we're going to begin. As I said, I'm so, I, I, I'm so ready to see, because you know, many times we have an idea of what we would like God, God to do, but God will take that idea of ours and, and make it just seem as nothing, amen? Sometimes he'll just, he'll just turn it around and, and do whatever he desires to do. And, and here's the thing, as, as they were teaching in the class this morning, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done, amen? I believe that through this time, there's some things that have been on your heart. You've been asking God for a long time, some of you. And God is going to, God's going to answer you. He's going to bring clarity. He's going to, he's going to answer your prayers. I'm, I'm expecting for him to just move in a powerful way in healing and in, in every way. I, I know he's going to do it. He's going to set the captive free. Amen. And, and. You know, sometimes we, we in, even as believers, can be captive. We can be bound because of a thought, because of something that we've allowed the enemy to have that power over us. And, and, and we need to be able to come against that in the name of Jesus and know how to. And God has given us the fast for that, to break that, to break that yoke, to break all of that off of us. In Jesus' name, James chapter 5. And verse 16 is where I'm going to start. And would you stand for the, for the reading of God's word? He says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for your presence, God, in this place today. We ask that, God, that you would move, continue to do, Father, move among your people. I pray that, God, that you would begin to open the eyes, Father, of those that, Father, that, that may not see, Father, what the enemy is doing in their lives, but, God, that you would begin to, to just be, reveal to them, Father, by the power of your spirit, God. I pray that, Father, that as we hear your word, God, we would be set free. That, Father, that we would not just be hearers, but we would be doers. That, God, that we would move, Father, in the presence of your spirit, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come. And that you would do what only you can do. What no man can do. But what only you can do. There are many here, Father, today that are hurting. There are many, my God, that are here today, Father, that are just needing a touch from you. And God, before we leave this place, I pray, Father, that you would reveal yourself to them. And that you would show yourself strong on their behalf in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're going to be speaking today about the power of prevailing prayer. The power of prevailing prayer. You know, we could never over express or, or overestimate the power of prayer. There's, there's no possible way. And, and the problem is, is too many times we underestimate what prayer is and the power of prayer and how important it is. Andrew Murray said this in relation to, to his people. And I want you to hear this. This is so powerful. This is going to be a, a, a theme that is going to, to follow us throughout this message today. God works only in answer to their prayers. It is in prayer that we change our natural strength for the supernatural strength of God. Now, I want you to notice something. That word only is only in answer to prayer does God move. You know, it's, it, there's no other way to get God to move. The, the, the great Bible teacher, Dr. R.A. Torrey, said this. He says, nothing lies beyond the reach of prayer except that which lies beyond the will of God. Nothing lies beyond the reach of prayer except that which lies beyond the will of God. And we're going to discern some of these things today. 
You see, we, we, uh, Dickerson says that, that we have to depend, when we depend upon natural things like organization, education, finances, then we get what they can do. But when we call upon God, we get what He alone can do. Can I tell you, church, what our world needs is not what education can do. It's not what organization can do. It's not what finances can do. Because we've seen all of that at work in our world today. What we need is what God alone can do in His church and in this world today. And it's something that we have to begin to seek Him for. See, you don't have a a failure in your life that is not somehow... A, a, a cause or a failure of prayer. There's a, if there's a failure in your life, then it's because there's a failure of prayer in your life. See, you don't have a need, but what the earnest and fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman cannot change. And this is going to be our focus today. You see, he says, confess your faults one to another, pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You see, the apostle James, he was the half-brother of Jesus. He had several reoccurring themes all the way through his epistle. And one of them is the power of prevailing prayer, which is intercession. Intercession is a lost art today. It's something that not many people know how to do. Intercession is, is not just... Going to God and getting things that we need, but it's but it's getting on our knees even for those that we don't know. Those are our, our friends, our brothers, our sisters, those who are in need. You see, the Bible says this, and this is what James says. He says, Confess your faults one to another. You know, all of us we, we want to make a difference for God's kingdom. We, we want to we see people saved and come into the kingdom, amen? We, we want to see God's, God's power at work in people. And, and how many of you know that this is true? We all want to be an influence on others. And we all are an influence on others. The question is, what kind of an influence are you? What kind of an influence are you making in the lives of those that are around you. What about your home? You know, it's, it's so easy to, to come to church and put on, put on the, the suit. And, and it's so easy to, to come to church and put on the, the face and all of the facade and everything. But how many of you know you can't do that with your, with your brothers, your sisters, your mother, your father, your husband, your wife? You see, and that's, that's really, when we think about it, that's who we really are. What kind of an influence and an impact are we making on those who really know who we are? You see, obviously, Jesus had to make such an impact on James. Because here's James, the half-brother of Jesus, and, and now he is confessing him as Lord and as God. Imagine your brother, your half-brother, your, your, your half-sister looks at you and says, hey, hey. Uh, I'm the son of God. Hmm. <laughs> you're going to have to do a whole lot to prove it. You, you, you see, you're not going to believe it, but obviously Jesus had some kind of an impact upon James's life that James changed his, his whole outlook on who Jesus is. So if we're going to pray for our friends, there's four things that we must do. Number one, it's the confession That we must make. And I pray that you're taking notes today. Because here's the thing church. We can get excited about God. We can can come and we can hear about God. But it's only what we put into practice that matters. Are you hearing me? It's only what we put into practice that matters. So I pray that you would write some things down. You don't have to write everything down, but something stands out to you, write it down. Somewhere you can go go back to it. So it's the confession that we must make. He says, confess your faults one to another. See, now, now most of us, we're not very good about confessing our faults, right? Come on. We're skilled indeed at criticizing. Boy, it got quiet in this church. 
We're skilled at, at criticizing our friends and our family. We're experts at, 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 at pushing people away from us. And, 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 but, but to our own harm, the one thing that we lack in is confessing our faults. We're good at concealing them. We don't want anybody to know what's going on in our lives. See, it, it's the cover-up that we do. We, we, we don't want anyone to, to peer too deep in. We, we don't want to open ourselves. We don't want to become vulnerable. Because many of us have been hurt. We've, we've been there before. We don't want to go there anymore. See, do, do, but do you long to see revival in your home? Do you long to see a revival here in the church today, in our nation? Why do you want a revival? Where do you want a revival? You see, throughout history, revival begins with confession. Now, I I, want to just... I want to just blow the top off of some of your, your theology or maybe your thinking about revival, about reformations, about the move of God that has taken place over history. You see, a lot of people, they want to focus on a, on a man. They want to focus on a person. They want to, they want to focus on an event. But, but here's the thing. If you study the history of revival, you'll find that every great revival... The, the one thing that marked it was not a great preacher. It wasn't the great music. It wasn't the, the, those things that, that we tend to look at. It was the confession of sin. Not only to God, but also to one another. You see, when confession occurs, there's restoration. It is when people, it is when people begin to, let me say it, repent. We hear about it. We, we know the, 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 the chapter verse, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Man, we can quote it. We, every, every see you at the pole, every prayer meeting that we have, if my people. But the, the problem is, is we know it. If my people would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. You see, he, he's not talking to the world out there. He's talking to the church and those who sit in a church pew. Those are the ones that he's talking to. He's not speaking to the world out there. We want to get the sinners to confess. And we want to get the sinners to repent. But what God is saying is to you and to me. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. And turn from their wicked ways. He says then and only then. This is the way that it happens. There's no other way. This is the way church that we have to come to God. See, where God's people are broken, that's where God begins to move. It's when God's people are broken. In verse 16, he says, confess your faults that you may be healed. Now, now, did you have to put that stipulation there? Absolutely. I didn't put it there. James did. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. See, it doesn't only refer to the healing of the body. But it also goes on beyond that. And it refers to the healing of the soul, the healing of the spirit, the healing of the physical, the healing of the mind, of the emotional, of of, of restoration that has been needed. See, when we begin to confess our sins, God begins to move in and he begins to do a work. Well, I don't want to confess my sins. Well, you're going to stay right where you're at. You see... We, 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 we turn now to Psalm 51. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me. Psalm 51. In verse 16, this is what he says. It's a key passage in, in, for, for insight into looking what we're, we're, we're going to be delving in this morning. Amen. Psalm 51. See, Psalm 51 is a, pra- is, a, is a prayer that David had given after he had sinned and his sin was found out. He says this in verse 16. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delights not in burnt offerings, but the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart, O God, Thou wilt not despise. Now, now hear me, church. And I want you to pay very close attention. 
Because we are getting ready to go in. We are already in a fast. And here's the thing. A fast is a type of sacrifice. Now the Bible tells us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. But do you remember what Samuel said to, to Saul? He said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Now here's the thing. If you're going to sit here and go on this fast, and you're not going to obey the word of God, I'm telling you, you better do yourself some good and eat something. Because you're not going to be doing yourself any good. If you're not going to obey what the word of God says, if you're not going to put into action what God tells us, then, then, then we are not doing ourselves any good. If you flip over a couple of chapters to, to chapter 66 and verse 18, he says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66 verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, you've got to pay attention to that not right there. He's not going to hear you if you regard iniquity in your heart. Now, here in America, most of us, we don't like to waste our time doing anything, right? We, 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 we go to the store. We want to get in and out. Well, at least, at least uh, if, if, if you're not clothes shopping, <laughs> Because I know some people can stay there all day. Amen. But, but, but as Americans, we want to get in now. We don't want to waste the time in line. We, we don't want to spend our time and, and waste our time doing this or that. We, we've got smartphones. We've got microwaves. We've got everything so that we can, we can just move right along. But, but I want to take a closer look at what it means to regard iniquity in my heart. You see, it isn't simply being aware of sin in our heart, but a fuller understanding of this, of this phrase, how do we regard iniquity? This, th here's a, a, a few ways that it can be translated. If I cherish sin in my heart, it means if I, if I really desire to sin. Now, don't go fooling yourself. There's a lot of people that sit in a church that desire to do the things that they shouldn't be doing. And then this, this is how they kind of cover it up. Pastor or, or brother or sister, they, they might ask you, do you think it's okay to do this? Well, your heart's already condemning you. You know the answer to that. But yet you want to continue in sin. See, they want to cherish the sin in their heart. It's to cherish evil in the heart. It's to behold wickedness in my heart. It's to, it, in other words, it's to ponder on a thing and to think upon a thing and to stay thinking upon a thing. You see, it's, it's it, 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 to entertain evil in the heart. You, you see, a lot of times you can't avoid what comes across your path in a day's time. You might be sitting at a restaurant, you might be going somewhere down the road or whatever, and you can't stop from something passing in front of you. But it's the second look. It's the pondering upon that thing. It's, it's, it's not taking that thought captive and bringing it under the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's, but it's entertaining it. It's not going to hurt anything just to think on it a little while. But what did Jesus say? If you think on it, You've already done it. Why? Because God, Jesus knew that that was the seed. If you sit there and think upon it, it's going to begin to grow. And it's going to begin to flourish. It's going to begin to do something. And the next thing you know, don't, don't be surprised when you're all caught up in sin. You thought on it. You entertained the thought. It's to hold sin in your heart. It, it, it's it, enjoying, and you've enjoyed having sin in your heart. You've considered evil. It, it's hiding sin in my heart. Now, it's that secret sin that nobody knows about, but, but you, at least you think. It's that one little thing. I, I do all of this for God. He's not going to be upset if I do this one thing. It'll be okay if I, if I do this. But besides, it, it, it isn't hurting anybody. Come on. It isn't hurting anybody. Listen to me. Your sin is everybody's business. And your sin hurts everybody. You may not think so, but, but once that sin comes to light, and it will. 
it will begin to show you what it was there to do. Because every sin has an assignment. And it's to steal, to kill, or to destroy. And when that sin has, has taken full, full effect, you will see the assignment that it had upon your life and upon those that are around you. One version puts it this way. You've been cozy with evil. You've been, you've been courting it. You've been, you've, been, you've been right there beside it. it. It's not really that big of a deal. You see, the problem is with, with little sins, as the Bible says with little foxes, they spoil the vine. Little sins don't stay little. You see, you, you, the, the, the little sins, you, you, you court, well, it, nobody knows. It's really not all that bad. Uh, I, you, you're listening to something you know you shouldn't be listening to, but, but it, it may not glorify God. But let me ask you something. Does it edify you? Is it building up your spiritual man? Is it drawing you closer to God? Is it making you more like Jesus Christ? Because the whole effort of the Holy Spirit in your life is to conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. To make you just like him. Oh, well, it doesn't have bad words in it. It doesn't say anything bad. And you're excusing it. Hmm. Mm-hmm. What is it in your life that you're listening to, that you're watching, that you're putting before your eyes? You're not safeguarding. You're not putting up those, those fortresses. You're not fortifying your spirit with the good things. I've hid thy word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I'm not putting other junk in there because other junk is going to lead me to sin. I, I, I hope you're getting the picture. You see, some people are comfortable walking around with it, letting it take root, not realizing what it's really doing. God says if we regard it, then we're wasting our breath when we come to him in prayer. He said, if I regard sin in my heart, then the Lord will not hear me. How many of you are tired of praying empty, fruitless prayers? This is the problem. This, this could very well be one of the, the, the problem. That you have regarded something in your heart, and therefore... God is not answering. He refuses to hear you. Every time you get down on your knees, he is not listening to you. If you are not obeying the word of God, he is not listening to you. I tell you. I tell you, God, God here. He, he comes down hard on us. But it's a true thing. Do you want God to move in your life? Or do you not want God to move in your life? You know, the one thing that I, I, I've, I've often, and I know I said it on, on Wednesday, but here's the one thing I, I, I've, I've remembered many times getting down on my knees and I've, been, and I've been in prayer and I tell God, God, I love you. And I'm convinced of it. I say, God, I love you. And the Holy Spirit speaks back to me and he says, now, now don't get offended, son, but you don't love me nearly what you think you love me. You see, sometimes we think we're somewhere. But we're not listening to God because, because God, we, we, we don't want to hear what he has to say. Because we might not like what he has to say to me. Because I think that I'm up here when I'm down here, and I'll never get up here if I keep thinking that I'm up here. And we have to be very careful about this. In Matthew chapter 5, you see, then there's reconciliation. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. He says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that, that, that your brother has something against you, then leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now, now I, want you to, I want to point a few things out. You see, if you have something, you're bringing it, that gift, before God, and all of a sudden you remember something's in your mind that, that you had against your brother, and, 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 and you come to the altar, God says, you better leave it there. Go make that right before you come to me. Why? Because you are regarding iniquity in your heart. 
Now Jesus is speaking to you and me. That before you and I can bring that gift, he'd much rather you get your your life right with your brothers and sisters. He wants you to go to that brother, to that sister. He wants you to make that right. See, uh, when, when we come to God and we come before that brother or sister, we have to confess our faults. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I, I, I want to confess my faults. Now, now, don't get too excited. I'm going to explain this in just a few minutes because, because I want to clear some things up. But heaven rejoices And the angels sing, the Bible says, when fellowship and reconciliation begins to take place, when a lost sinner comes and see, and when that's reconciliation. So, So all of heaven rejoices, but there can be no reconciliation until confession has been made. You you want to know one of the things that I've noticed in my life a lot of times? People will come to me and they 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 and, and, and as a pastor, I've seen it over and over and over and over again in my life. They'll come to me, and they want to make things right, but they don't want to confess their sin. They want to come to me, and they want to say, well, you know, how's everything going? They knew that they did something. Oh, pastor, everything good, everything. And I've seen this down through the years. But they don't want to come forward with what they really came to say. But here's the thing. Even if I forgive them, Healing doesn't come because they have not yet confessed. You see, if there's someone that you need to ask forgiveness of, you need to be honest. You need to name those people. Answer, an, answer truthfully this to yourself. Are you willing to make arrangements to contact somebody that you know that you've made you you've wronged. Come on now. And, and think about this. And, and 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 write down your answer in your notes right there. Are you willing to do this? Now I'm gonna clear this up. See, remember, to not decide is to decide. To not decide is to decide. Why are you bringing this right now, Pastor? Why, why do you seem to be, to, to be stuck on this? Because do you truly want revival in your home? Do you truly want healing in your family, in your body, wherever it may be? Do you truly want to see God move in your life? See, sometimes that's not possible. Maybe that person's far away. Pick up the phone. Maybe they've passed on. Then you need to get on your knees and take that before God. Now, there are some people that you just cannot reconcile with. Amen? And the Bible says, don't cast your pearl before swine. Now, now, what, what do you mean, Pastor? There's no reason. Because, because it, you know it, 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 just as well as they know that they're not going to forgive you. And you know that just to go to them, sometimes it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be a mistake. If, if you know that it's going to put your life in danger, then don't go to that person. Take that before God. Write it down. Make it clear. And take that to God. I'm not saying to go do something that, that, that is unbiblical. And I'm not saying to go do something that is going to put your life in harm. But if you've truly, if you've truly haven't reconciled that thing, you see... I, I want to I state this because it, because it applies. See, the missionaries to China, they testified at, about uh, the, the great uh, Shantung revival. They reported that the revival began when the missionaries began to confess their faults one to another. And they had begun to ask for forgiveness and made re- reconciliation. And it, it was at that point that God began to restore and God began to pour out his spirit. You see, God is in the business of restoring. Amen. Now, 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 come on now. We're in the business many times of getting even. Oh me or oh my. We, we, want, we want it now. We, we want somebody to come and we want them. And, and here's the thing. 
I know, I, I, I've been in this position many times. And, and you know what? I, I've, I've often said, b- before they've even gone out the door, they were forgiven. I never held a grudge. Never, never let, it was, it was done. I, I didn't, if they came back, they came back. If they didn't, they didn't. Who cares? Doesn't bother me. But you know, when I needed, when I needed that is when I did the wrong. When I felt compelled to go to somebody it was because I did it. And something was in my heart and something was condemning me. And something was driving me. And those are the times where, when, when God had put it upon my heart. You need to go to your brother and your sister. Now that's the hard part. You see, I never looked for it. If they want to come and they want to ask forgiveness, then let them ask for forgiveness. But if not, I'm, I'm fine. I, I release those kind of things. I've learned a long time ago, you've got to release those, or those hurts. You've got to release that junk. Because, because what you're doing is you're allowing that to have power over you. And you can't let that devil have power over you. You can't allow those things to have power over you. Now... Now, revival comes under those circumstances. So, so I want to I, I, I want to look at just 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 a closer look at what it means. Uh, confession really means, as we said, it's you, you don't you don't cast your pearl before swine, and 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 you need to be careful what you say. What you when you go to confess, you see, care has to be taken because even in the confession, the devil can take it and turn it around for his advantage. So I'm not going to go. Confess to somebody that I think is going to go and blab about me somewhere else. I don't have any, I don't need to to do that. So here's a principle to follow when you remind, when you remember a circle of confession. It, It needs to follow this, the circle of sin. What does this mean? Private sin means private confession. It means between you and the Lord with, or with a trusted partner who will pray for you. To get the victory over something. Personal sin needs personal confession. If you've sinned against me or sinned against, uh, if I've sinned against you, then, then I need to go and, and confess to you and not talk about it to other people. Can you believe? I can't believe what they did to me. I can't believe how they hurt me. Can you believe that? My goodness, if it hurts that much, go. And make reconciliation. But you might be surprised. You might be the one in the wrong. You know, one thing that I've realized in in, in a lot of this is is what we we don't want to admit. There's a lot of misunderstanding. I may say something here today. and, and, And somebody sitting out there misunderstands me and says, can you believe what pastor said? Can you believe how he treated me and how he's talking to us? Think about it like this. Can you believe? And, and, and <laughs> you see, Brother Clendenin was a wise man. And he said, he, he, he said this one time when he was preaching and, and powerful man of God. He said, when you throw a, a, a rock into a parking lot full of dogs, the only one that's going to yelp is the one you hit. He said, after I said that, that, church, that service, he said, some lady came up to me afterwards and said, do you realize that you called us dogs? And he said, he said, I must have hit her. I don't need anybody coming up to me after church and saying, do you believe that he called us swine? Let the rock fall where it may. <laughs> But here's the thing. Many times it's the misunderstanding of something. And and, and most of the time I would say that that's exactly what it is. Somebody says something and and, and you hear it from somebody else or you hear something else. And then all of a sudden it gets all twisted out of of, of whack and you're all upset. and, and, And ain't nobody said anything to hurt anybody. Hmm. You see, we need to be careful. We need to be careful when we go forward 
See, public sin requires public confession. If you have publicly dishonored the Lord, then you need to publicly repent, publicly get right, uh, publicly get right with God. Because even though you've changed in your heart, your brothers, your sisters don't know it. See, so James saying, "Confess your sins one to another, your faults one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed." I I, I tell you what, when people finally do come and they do say that, listen to me, I see that person as as like, man, that was difficult. For, for, For you to come and admit to me that you've done something, I commend you because because that is not an easy thing to do. And, and so when people do that, I'm just like, it, it floors me. Why? Because I see the love of God in that. And you see, and so, so moving, moving along, because I know I'm, I, I can just sit here and, and continue. The second thing that we need to do is, is the command that we should mind. Here's what James says in, 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 in chapter 5 and verse 16. He says, pray one for another. See, after we've confessed our sins, what's the next thing? It's to pray for one another. This, and and who's, who's Jesus telling to pray for one another? He's telling us to pray one for another. In, in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, he, says, he says, rejoice always in verse 16. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of Christ Jesus for you. Think about this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you. In, in Samuel chapter 12, they, they, the, the, the people of Israel had a king in mind, and, and, and the judges were no longer enough. Samuel at that time... God had raised him up to be the prophet, the judge over those people. But but the people had looked around and they wanted a king like all the the kingdoms of the world and all the natural kings of the world, the nations of the world had a king. And so they wanted a king. And so Samuel goes through with the whole thing, knowing that, that, that what they were doing was wrong because God was their king and God was using the judges to lead them but they wanted to be just like the rest of the people so so as, as the months had gone on they they ruled in a worldly king but the people what they didn't realize is they had sinned against God they had sinned against God and so Samuel tells them pray this is all you can do is pray can i tell you sometimes all you can do is pray and confess those things. See, most of our, our lost friends and our family members, they don't have the insight to know that they have done wrong. And all you can do is pray. So Samuel goes, and they're just like, how, is, 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 how are we going to get over this? God is going to destroy us. And Samuel says, no, 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 no. I'm going to pray for you. Because in your ignorance, you did this. It doesn't mean that, that, that God just turns a blind eye to it. No. I'm telling you, but if they continued in their ignorance, they would have been judged. But it was up to Samuel to stand up and pray for them. Because listen to what he says in verse, 30, in verse 23. He says this, Moreover, as for me, Samuel saying this, God forbid that I should get sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. You know, when somebody's hurt you, when somebody's done you wrong, the best thing you can do is pray for them. That's what you do. You, you don't have to do all of these other things. You've got to pray for them. He says, God forbid that that it was going to be a sin if I didn't pray for you. And he says, but I'm going to teach you what is good and right. You see, because, because sometimes people just need guidance. They don't need you to stand over there and over them and Lord over them and tell them everything that they've... No, they just need somebody to pray for them and lead them. See, they'd sin. 
Now, prayer is the greatest, greatest privilege that a Christian has. Prayer is the greatest privilege that a Christian has. You and I have the opportunity to talk to the almighty God. Prayer is the greatest, uh, is the greatest Christian power. See, more things are brought about through prayer than any other means. What do you mean, pastor? I want you to think about this. Everything is brought about by prayer. For those of you who do not value prayer, I want, I want to stress this point right here. Think about this, if you will. You may not value prayer, but I want you to go back through the word of God. I want you to go back. Noah prayed. Abraham prayed. Isaac prayed. Jacob prayed. Joseph prayed. Elijah prayed. You, you, you name it, they prayed. And, and it wasn't until they prayed that something happened. It wasn't until they got alone with God that, the, that, that the, the waters parted. It wasn't until Elijah prayed that the fire fell. It wasn't until they went and they began to pray. Every instance in the word of God, it was a man or a woman that prayed and God moved. But we don't think prayer is all that great. We'd rather do a hundred other things than pray. We don't like to pray. Why? Because, because we're wasting our time. And for so many, they are. Because you regard sin in your heart. And you don't want to confess it. You don't want to get rid of it. You don't want to move on into the deeper things of God. God, help me. See, prayer is the greatest Christian failure. It's the greatest Christian failure. It's the main thing that's overlooked over all, because of all. The Bible says in, in James chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, because we do not ask. You see, you have not because you ask not. So you prayed for your friend, but, but, but oh, uh, um, did you really believe? You ever notice sometimes when, when, when a notorious sinner gets saved, Gives their heart to Christ. Everyone watches them. And everybody looks at them. And the first thing that, 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 that you know, he slips on or falls on. Everybody's like, see? Did you see what they did? Look what they did. Uh, we knew it. It wasn't real. That's why they say that the church is the only one that kills their wounded. Because instead of praying for them, and instead of encouraging them, and instead of restoring such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering ourselves, why do we pray for somebody and why do we want to restore them in the spirit of meekness? Is because considering yourself, because that could very well be you. Oh, it'll never be me. Be careful when you think you stand. Because you're about to fall face first. This is one of the things that many times I know people may, may think that, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit hard from the pulpit. But here's the thing. Here's the reason why. Because, because what I say up here is preventative. If I can stop you from making the mistake, then, then, then the word of God has, has done its job. And I've done my job. But here's the thing. If you go on and you make that mistake anyway, then it's not for me to go and stand over you while you're down and, and to say, I told you and the word of God says and you're going to hell. And No, it's not for me to do that. But so many people want to do that. What is it for me to do? It, it, it's Jesus when you, when you see him preaching against sin. Nobody preached harder against sin than Jesus Christ. Nobody talked more about hell than Jesus Christ. And why was he doing it? Because he didn't want you to sin. Because he didn't want you to go to hell. Because of those things. But, but, but he looked at the Pharisees and said, you snakes, you sons of the devil. 
And can I tell you, there's a lot of people who are with a religious tongue that fit that, fit that creed. And Jesus said, he said, he preached against it. But, but what does he do when he sees the person that's fallen? He's the meekest. He's the lowliest. He reaches down, and in the spirit of meekness, he reaches and he grabs them and he picks them up while everybody else is condemning and ready to throw their stones. Jesus says, he that was without sin cast the first stone. He's the meekest and the lowliest to those who have fallen. We as believers could take understanding from this. And we should approach it that way because we could be there one day. The third thing, and and I'll go through it pretty quick, is the conditions that we as believers should meet. Could break off and and let it go, but no, we're we're gonna go through this. How many give me five minutes? 5, 10, 15, 20, 30. (laughs) See, James has been telling us about the conditions for answered prayer. Beginning in chapter 1, he explained the condition for for we believers that, that we have to meet. He says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea that uh, with the wind and, and is with the wind and tossed. See, we've already seen in, in James chapter four and verse two, and we often we we often fail to ask because he says we ask not so we don't have, but then sometimes we ask, but we ask the wrong things. So first of all, we have to pray in faith. Second, we have to pray according to the will of God. You see, this is, and, and, and this is what he tells us. In verse 16 of chapter 5, James adds two more conditions that we need to meet. The first one is the intensity of the asking, and the second is the integrity of the asker. It's the intensity in which we ask. And second, it's the integrity of the person that's asking. Now, you and I are sitting here thinking, okay, but but I thought we could just... No, sometimes you've got to get down and pray. You see, James, as he's explaining this, he actually brings in the, the, the prophet Elijah into the whole thing. And, and, and he says, he, he says that, that in the intensity, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, the effectual fervent prayer. And, and so he's, he, he's showing that even Elisha on that day, he was, he was praying. We, we, I'm telling you, he's standing there. There's 450 prophets of Baal that are praying to their gods and he is telling them, pray. Maybe, he's, maybe your God has gone somewhere. Maybe he's off doing something. Maybe he's just mis, misled you or something. He says, give it to him, pray. And so they begin to pray even, even more intense. You see, you, the, the two have to be combined. They begin to pray more intense. The Bible says they even cut themselves. We talked about it last week. And nothing happens. But here's the thing. It's his turn next. And fire better fall. Because if not, it's his head that's going to roll. And so I'm telling you, he got down and he began to pray. See, the effectual fervent prayer, I, I, I want to just, it, it takes two words to, mean, to explain what it means in the Greek. It literally means stretched out, like a horse that is jumping over a barricade, or an athlete that is running to the finish who burst the tape and stretches himself out for the goal. He's, he's stretching himself to make sure that he's the first one across. 
He's giving it everything that he has. In the Latin, the fervent means to boil or, and froth. It means that it's, it's, it's hot. It's not lukewarm. It's not just some little, little prayer. Oh, Lord, I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Some people have been praying the same prayer year after year, and nothing has changed. You're still praying the same prayer your mama prayed over you as a child. No, at some point, you're going to have to get in there, and you're going to have to stretch yourself. You're going to have to get in there and spend some time in prayer. My wife had reminded me about this as we were driving home yesterday coming from the camp. When I had gone to Nigeria, I, I thought it was one of the greatest experiences that I'd ever had. I thought I was going there for them. Really, I was going there for me. I, I went there thinking that I was going to minister, and I did. But I was ministered too. And it was during that time in my life that God did a, real, a, a really great work in my life. And, and, and I'll never forget it. The pastor said, man, uh, his wife said, Man, if the people would just pray like our mothers and fathers used to pray. I was dumbfounded. Because when I would come to the service, the people were there praying. When I was preaching, the people were there praying. When, when I was done and we began to altar call, the people would begin to pray, and it was fervent prayer. And, and I'm sitting there in an altar, and we're going 30 minutes, and there's nothing. I mean, it isn't cooling. It isn't stopping. Hour goes by, and the pastor pulls out the bell, this bell from underneath his pulpit, and he starts ringing that thing to quiet everybody down. And then he says, you know what? We need to pray for this. And he puts that bell down. And there we go for another hour, hour and a half. People just coming one after the... And, and, and this statement that his wife had made earlier and, and it just blew my mind. If they would pray like their parents used to pray. And I was thinking, if, 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 if us as Americans would just pray like them... And I'm sitting here, and I, and I asked him later, I said, what is that bell for? He says, I have to use it. He says, because if not, he said, they'd spend all night praying. He said, so I've got to stop them at some point and send them home. You think you love God? Be careful when you get down to pray and, he, and you hear these words. And, and he doesn't want you to be offended when you hear these words. You don't love me nearly what you think that you do. So don't go and getting yourself on some place where you're not. What it's going to take is us to get on our knees and truly seek God. And truly seek God. He says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Let me say this, and I don't say this to boast. I came home last night. My wife and I, they had a great time. We had a great time coming home. I was dead tired. I went in and I took a shower and I got ready to go to bed and I couldn't sleep. And I knew it was a fight against the enemy. So I got up and I began to pray. And I began to pray. Three o'clock in the morning, I realized I'm not getting any sleep tonight. And I could have sat there and whined, and I could have tried to sit there, and, 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 and I just said, you know what? Let me go back to the Word. And I began to read, and I began to pray, and I began to read. And can I tell you this? And I don't say this for any... I haven't gotten a wink of sleep since yesterday morning. But see, this is a one-time thing. And what God is looking for is a people that really wants Him. And I'm not saying that you're going to have to stay up all night every night and never get any sleep and walk around like a zombie or something. But, but, I'm, but all of us know that we can give God more than we are. 
Every one of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we, we know that we can give God more than we are giving him. And I had to realize that this is the enemy, and he's come, and he's attacking. And the only way that, that, that you can thwart off the enemy is by prayer. It's not by, by, by oh, God, I, I read my Bible, and I do this. No, he doesn't care what you do in Sunday school. He doesn't care if you come to church and listen to the preaching. He doesn't care if you come in a worship service and raise your hands and worship and sit out there. And, and, and he doesn't care if you all the things that you think you are and, and what you think that you're doing. He, he doesn't care. He sees the heart. What he's really wanting is your heart. And can I tell you this? If he had your heart and my heart, we'd look and sound a lot more like Jesus. What does Jesus say? Pray for your enemies. But I don't want to pray for my enemies. And if I do, I want to pray like David prayed. Isn't that the attitude sometimes? God scorn them. We may not say it, Oh, God, bless him. No, you're really not saying bless him. Not underneath your breath. Final thing. Of the four things, this is the fourth and final, is the character that we should manifest. And I got into it already a little bit. See, from the description of verses 17 and 18, you can, you can tell that he's speaking about Elisha. We have to have integrity. It's all we have in this life. It's the integrity that we carry. Who are you? What are, what, what are you? What am I? Bear with me just a few minutes. Bear with me. Because this is, this is, this is real. This is, this is real. This isn't something that we just come up here and we just have to get a message together just so that we can do something on Sunday morning and so we can say we came to church, we listened to a message, and we went home. Forget about that. If that's the Christianity you want, fold it up, go home. But if you really want to know who God is and you want to delve in deeper, listen to this. It's the integrity that we have. It's not what we are when everybody's around, but who are we when nobody else is around? Are we a praying people? Do we, do we look to God? Do we trust in God? See, you can look it up on your own time. We talked about it in 1 Kings chapter 18. You see, James uses this episode uh, of, of the prophet to, to illustrate the effectual fervent prayer. And here it is of a righteous person. Because the others weren't righteous. See, the prophet lived a life of such integrity before God that he could literally call fire down from heaven. You ever wondered why you can't lay hands on the sick and they don't, and they don't get healed? Can I tell you this? God hasn't lost his power. Who has? We have. It's not God that has lost his power, but it is us. You see, God wants men and women with integrity. In Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. In Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, he says, Behold, the Lord's arm is not shortened that he cannot save, Neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sin has have hid his face from you, and he will not hear you. See, God doesn't God doesn't have a problem with his hearing. He just chooses not to. He just chooses not to. It's kind of like when, when your kids have done something and you've asked them to do it a hundred times and they, and they haven't done it and they haven't done it and then they ask you for that thing that they want. You choose not to hear them. 
you choose not to hear them. It's a form of discipline. And the Bible says that God disciplines those that he loves. He's not trying to be mean. He's telling you that he loves you. 